Here's the situation. Some of you may be familiar with this. They're driving through campus, and all of a sudden, a student starts to the road. The question is, how do you know how hard to apply the brake to come to a stop smoothly and, of course, prevent the collision? This is the problem of visually guided brakes. We know a lot about this problem already. We know there's an optical variable called tau, specifies time to contact with the optical. And for ongoing control, if we take the rate of change, tau dot, set it equal to minus one half, you will ensure a constant deceleration. Come to a stop just as you approach the obstacle, thereby avoiding a collision. We can say then, the tau dot strategy of visually guided braking is to move in order to produce the perceptual invariant tau dot equals minus 0 0.5. But what if we're approaching an obstacle in this case, in this case at a total speed? The tau dot strategy still predicts constant smooth deceleration. But that's not how most of us would approach the toll booth. Specifically, if you're in a hurry, you might wait until you get closer before you start applying the brake. Is this a failure of the tau dot strategy? I think to be fair, it isn't. Because the tau dot strategy is only meant to explain how we control ongoing action once it's initiated. We need something else to tell us when we start the brake. And this leads to a historical division in perception action research. On the one hand, we have research on the affordance problem, how we perceive opportunities for action, how we select among them, and how and when we initiate an action. On the other hand, we have the control problem with tau dot strategy. As an example, how we regulate an ongoing action. And these have been studied separately. Our objective then is simple. We just want to present a unified framework for understanding action initiation, action <coughs> selection, and action regulation all together. We're not the first to have this idea, of course. Brett Cajun has proposed a theory he calls affordance-based control, where we try to bring affordances into the realm of ongoing action. According to this proposal, Actors are sensitive to the boundaries that separate the possible from the impossible, and that this is relevant to ongoing action. For example, in braking, the maximum deceleration that you can apply, the maximum braking given your vehicle or given the road conditions, this would be the action boundary for this situation. According to Fajian, this is the rule that we should follow. Move in order to prevent the action that is required from crossing this action boundary. It make, might make more sense in the specific case, prevent the ideal deceleration or the amount of braking that is required from moving beyond the maximum amount of braking that you can produce. It's actually quite simple. All it really means, keep the affordance afforded. Don't let it out of your reach. Don't drive so fast that you won't be able to stop. So to summarize these two approaches, in the traditional approach, we can call it information-based control. The breaking rule is move in order to generate tau dot equals minus 0 0.5. For affordance-based control, prevent required breaking from moving beyond maximum possible breaking. What's really important, though, is that these two approaches allow for different predictions. Information-based control makes a specific break in this case. This has made it easy to put dynamical models to it. Affordance-based control, on the other hand, doesn't make a specific break. In. It predicts a range of potential outcomes. This makes it difficult to model, because we don't know exactly what it's predicting. But there's an advantage. This allows for flexibility, an important part of agency. So remember the toll booth. One morning you're late for work, you might approach the toll booth in a more aggressive manner than you usually do. This is a case where you perceive the same affordance, there's the same final outcome, but a different trajectory to get there. 
and this is what the Border Space Control might let us get at. So our question is, how can we take the success of dynamical models in information-based control, and specifically the breaking, and apply that to the Border Space Control? What I want to consider is that these two theories are not as different as you might think. Specifically, what is the required action for affordance based control? It's whatever action generates the perceptual invariance. So for breaking, the required breaking is whatever breaking produces tau dot equals minus one half. So these two approaches really have the same core. What we try to do then is to understand affordance based control by taking a foundation of information based control and adding some element that provides flexibility, the flexibility that we're working for. And this flexibility should be modulated by the action boundary. With the total group in the distance, you have some different options. In the emergency braking situation with a pedestrian, the action boundary is right there, and you have no choice but to break right away. So to show you how this works, let's look at a control law for the tau dot strategy. Here on the left, a control law tells you how you should adjust your behavior. In this case, how you should adjust the deceleration or how you should adjust the braking as a function of whatever information is available. And this just simply describes an attractor, a place where your behavior will tend to end up if you follow this rule. In this case, the attractor location is determined by the optical information, and it's at whatever point produces tau dot equals minus one half. The other element of this equation is this parameter k, which indexes here the attractor strength. How strong is the pole to reach this attractor? And usually, this is just set to a constant and decided in what we tried to do is to take advantage of this K parameter and open it up, use it for flexibility. Let the attractor strength adjust to the situation. And usually when we simulate these types of models, there's only one attractor in a lot of cases. So it doesn't really matter the attractor strength. The same thing will happen in the end. But if we put the attractor in competition with other influences on behavior, your desire to get to work on time, perhaps, then attractive strength becomes more important. There's other com competing influences. And here's the specific proposal. Attractive strength should be inversely proportional to how close you are to the action boundary. And again, this is simpler than it sounds. When you're far from the action boundary, the focus is still in the distance, the attractor is weak, you have some feeling that you might have to break, <coughs> but it's not an urgent. As you get closer and closer, the attractor gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And if you have some other influence on behavior, the desire to get to work on time, eventually the attractor for breaking will overpower that other influence. So it doesn't matter how strong the attractor for drive is fast is, the breaking attractor will eventually become stronger. But the real important question for this to work is that is there information for the driver to know how close he or she is to the action boundary? It can't work without it. In order for me to argue that there is information, I'm going to show you how we put that into the control law. So here's the basic equation. What we did is we multiplied the attractive strength by this bit in front of you. And the important part is this fraction here of the required deceleration or the required braking divided by the maximum possible braking. And so as required braking goes to maximum braking, this fraction goes to 1, the bit in parentheses goes to 0, and so this is an index of how close you are to the action boundary. What I need to show then is that there is information for this fraction. And luckily for us, once more, Brett Fajan has done some of the work for us. He's shown that required deceleration is specified by the global optic flow rate divided by tau. 
I can't show you the derivation here, but you can check it. And this is a quantity that requires units, so it needs to be calibrated. So why not calibrate it by the maximum acceleration? And th this notion of calibration is really important for uh, the theory of affordance space control. It's not something that we originally set out to touch upon, but when we put the model in this form, it turned out, without meaning to, we implemented Bayes' proposal for calibration, where he writes, when a driver is properly calibrated, he perceives the ideal deceleration in units of the maximum deceleration. And if this is the case, and if it affects the attractor strength like this, you can get the flexibility that will open up control laws to allow for um, different trajectories to the same happening. Let me show you how it works. In this case, we're using one additional competing attractor for a preferred speed. So in this case, all the simulated drivers prefer to drive at 10 meters per second. And I'll just show three simulations. All I'm changing is how strong they prefer 10 meters per second. They all prefer the same speed, but I'll ramp up how strong they prefer. So if we start with a, a driver who has a very weak preference for this speed, this is a cautious driver, and it turns out that the model basically reduces to the original tag-off strategy when the other influences are weak and we get this constant deceleration. If we make the preference stronger, we get this sort of coasting and then applying the brake. And we can take it to the extreme, and here we get the driver who's late for work, drives at full speed into the last possible <coughs> moment, slams on the brake. So what we see here is that we can combine the initiation of action with the ongoing control of action in a smooth way. So yeah, break them into last part. And so just to sum up, if we modulate attractive strength, we can provide flexibility. And if we do it in this way, it should work for any control law that has this simple form. How <coughs> dot control law. And it's consistent with information-based control as well as affordance-based control. We're not choosing one over the other. But there's still work to be done. We have to validate this experimentally, of course. And this requires coming up with a better understanding of what these competing constraints are. So preferred speed was just a simple standard to demonstrate the principle. But hopefully we can come up with something more realistic through experimentation. And if we string enough of these other influences on behavior together, maybe we can get a full-fledged model that can encompass many different behaviors. And if some of these other attractors have this same attractor strength modulation, and they also represent some importance, perhaps we can start to understand action selection as well. So that's something for next time. So thanks to uh, Michael Kirby and Phil Frank for helping me through this. And thank you all for listening. I think that would work, yes. What I prefer about this approach is that 
you can add any other term you want to the equation, and the uh, attractive equation will always win in the end. It's almost guaranteed, except for some very stupid entities. So uh, if you try to add some other factors onto the original um, just discrete how approach, the uh, the driver will collide every time because it's you know very it needs to be exactly right in order to be because one and further will collide. So here is we can have as many other influences on behavior as we might think are realistic and Can't hear. Uh, I think it's, I, I would like to generalize in other situations, but I think docking in particular is maybe one of the easier ones because it's still controlled by tau and tau dot as I, as I remember. So it might work with minimal, minimal change. Imagine I'm speeding towards the total. Okay, so I have a thing. There's a certain uh, maximum deceleration that I can achieve. And then sometime over the next eight seconds, it starts to rain. And so my maximum possible deceleration changes. What is it in the nature of your model? Or how, how would your model change so as to accommodate to the change in braking distance? And what would be the information that would recalibrate or, 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 or change the parameter values of, uh, of the model? Yeah, so in terms of the equation, I think, as you can imagine, that, that's the maximum deceleration. So in order for you to, to readjust, that's the recalibration process. And I would like to eventually uh, understand how phase in phase calibration should work by putting it also in a, in a dynamic equation and let it adjust over time. Um, but I don't, I don't have that yet. But the way, the way it would work for him is as the conditions change and you, you uh, the consequences of your action are changing, so you have to adjust the units that you're using to achieve one of And whether or not, you know, the experience with having a brain in the past looks good faster, I'm not sure, but that's a good question. Okay.